We begin this morning with Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the All Progressive Congress, who said that his life ambition is to become Nigeria's president. Now he's on the verge of knowing if this will be. Bola Tinubu will lead Nigeria's ruling APC into the next general elections after a landslide victory in the party's primary held in Abuja. The 70-year-old secured more than half, vote, half of the votes at the convention, winning 1,271 votes to defeat his closest rival, former Transport Minister Rotimi Amechi, who got 316 votes. Vice President Yemi Oshibaji came in third with 235 votes, while Senate President Hakmat Lawan got 152. Now let's take a look at the vision for Nigeria outlined in an acceptance speech. Our party is alive. They won't be able to do the convention. Here we have the first convention to choose a new executive. We put you there, it was successful. The governors put themselves together as party leaders and many other leaders. We worked hard. We didn't break our back. We are here, very happy and confident, courageous. <laughs> to tell you that the cat that lies down quietly is not the pretension of death, but breathing of the energy to devour its enemies. Now we are here. We will roar. We we do it. We, we, Ten Poverty Development Party. They call themselves PDP. 16 years of misery, 16 years of wastefulness, 16 years of failures, 16 years forgetting about our children today and tomorrow. We said, step aside, be buried, cry, and leave the way for us. We will repair our country and we bring it back as strong and the best nation for our children. Well, from the beginning, the process leading to the party special convention promised to be thrilling. It did not disappoint with uh, failed attempts to pick a consensus candidate and confusion over who really was President Muhammad Buhari's preferred candidate. The convention was not short of intrigues and drama, and Gosa Ngubo reports. As the ruling party, the special convention of the All Progressives Congress was bound to grab the nation's attention. With President Muhammad Buhari on the last lap of his administration, choosing his successor wasn't going to be an easy task. If the party was hoping to discourage more people from applying for the top job by charging an exorbitant fee, it must have been disappointed. Not less than 23 aspirants paid the 100 million naira for the expression of interest and nomination forms. Some bought the forms and did nothing to reach out to the delegates. Some visited a few states. Others hit the media waves with advertisements. Determining who would be delegate also became a guesswork. President Buhari had kept the nation guessing on whether he would sign the amendments to the Electoral Act to enable statutory delegates to vote. In the end, he didn't. Then came the gale of postponement. Following the decision of the Independence National Electoral Commission to concede to the request of political parties to extend the time within which primaries would be conducted, APC jumped at it. It appears that the parties have now presented a modified request for what the chairman calls a little adjustment. We will now discuss further to understand the basis for requesting this little adjustment. And thereafter, the commission will meet and a statement will be issued. Eventually, APC settled for June 6, 7, and 8 for the convention. That was when events started happening 
at a jet speed. Eleven northern governors elected on the party's platform agreed that the southern part of the country should produce the party's presidential candidates. There were reports that President Buhari endorsed this decision, but the presidency denied the reports. Governor Yaya Bello of Kogi State disagreed with his colleague governors from the north. I am a free citizen, a free member of the party, a qualified member of the party. I contested. I'm contesting. I bought the form. I was cleared to participate in the election. And no reason for me to be excluded from the ballot. If they do so, then that is a recipe for a bigger trouble for the party. And then came the shocker. APC National Chairman Ablai Adamu unilaterally announced Senate President Ahmed Lawan, one of the presidential aspirants, as a consensus candidate. That decision was met with stiff opposition. Eventually, sanity prevailed. All aspirants were going to contest, but reports emerged that the list had been pruned down to five and later to three. The drama did not end there. Before voting commenced, eight aspirants stepped down for Tinubu. That was early indication of where the pendulum would swing. I'm prepared to sacrifice my ambition to be the president of Nigeria that I would love to recommend to all my supporters, all my delegates, starting from the 48 delegates in Ekiti State, to all my supporters across the length and breadth of the country, is that you please accord me the respect to offer the support you are giving me to my elder brother, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. I want to urge all my supporters, I want to urge all of you that believe in me, that we have somebody that can do the job. We all rally around him to do the job. And it's no stranger to me. We have been together for quite some time. And that is Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. If delegates were to choose based on the speeches made by the aspirants, the vice president, also an aspirant, would have emerged as clear winner because the vice president gave a fascinating speech. It is possible to establish a tech economy here in Nigeria. It is possible to establish a bitumen processing industry in Ondo, gold processing in Zamfara and Oshun, and exploit and process the finest precious metals and stones in the world, in Benue, in Plateau, and most of the north-central states. We can exploit oil and gas in the Niger Delta, in the southeast, and now even in Bauchi and Gombe states. But delegates preferred Bola Tinubu, who though was not articulate, but was a great strategist. The emergence of a former Lagos state governor, Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, as presidential candidate of the All Progressive Congress APC, was first and the most important leg in the journey to the next year's presidential bout. That, of course, ushers in the second leg and sets up a new challenge for the ruling party, which is a search for a suitable running mate whose combination could help the party to victory in 2023 elections. Ironically, Tinubu, a Muslim southerner, is surrounded majorly by more Muslim northerners than their Christian brothers. There are KB state governors, Atiku Bagudu, Kaduna state governor, Malam Nasir, Air Rufai, Kano state governor, Abdullahi Ganduje, Plateau state governor, Simon Lalong, Malam Kashim Shatima Ibrahim, Governor of Borneo State, Governor of Borneo State, Babagana Zulum, Jigawa State Governor Atiku Baduru, Abaka Baduru, and Secretary to the Federal uh, Government, uh, that's uh, Boss Gida Mustafa. So no, there's a lot to break down here, a lot to break down. Yeah, I mean, where does one start? It was projected yesterday morning at the time of this show, mm. and it's now been confirmed. We all know we've heard the victory speech, and I'm sure there's a lot of commentary about that speech. There was some vitriol in that speech. Shame on you. 
happens. <laughs> <laughs> Calling the um, PDP, Property Development Party, termites, evil, all of that it was a very interesting speech. And that moment of you kept me waiting and this is my t chance for revenge, which I think was a joke, was tongue in cheek. But yes, and he did say, this is Ashiwaju Bala Metsunubu, that he was intoxicated by victory. And he clearly was in you know, a really good mood because that victory was a hard won battle. He yeah. fought for his political life and he won by a landslide. He got more votes than everybody else put together. Mm -hmm. Almost double, when you add every, all their votes, it's mm -hmm. almost double that he got. Not mm -hmm. quite, but close. <laughs> and it just goes to show the kind of trouncing he gave his opponents. So that, all the credit to him for that um, political miracle he pulled out of a, of a hat there. Now, it did look as though, and he said it as a cat, he used the analogy of a cat, like mm. you pretend to, you play dead only to pounce with mm. more ferocity. You know, that famous outburst of him, of mm. his in Abel Kuta, that fit of mm. peak, he was looking and sounding defeated mm -hmm. and angry and embittered. But apparently he had a few aces up his sleeve, which mm -hmm. he now presented with this huge flourish. And this is the next question that you have raised. He's, there's one half of the ticket now. The second half is the vice president. Mm. And for me, I would say generally in this current mood, a Muslim Muslim ticket will be electorally toxic. Mm. This is not 1993, the era of daddy. Well, my dad, MK well, <laughs> Abiola. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't, I never feign neutrality on the issue of my mm -hmm. father. He's not MK Abiola to me, he's daddy. He's that's daddy that. yeah. But this is not 1993. However, you could argue that if it's a Muslim Muslim ticket where those two Muslims are accepted by the generality as not going to attempt to Islamize the country, you don't need to go to the knee-jerk, perished thought. Mm. So you could argue it both ways. But it's instructive to know that even in his victory speech, Ashiwa Jubala Tenubu referenced religious intolerance in this mm. country. He referenced the Bible teaching. He referenced the fact that one religion should not be attacking the other. He referenced that lack of unity here. So generally, when we talk about zoning and rotation, we think in terms of ethnicity, which mm. the northern governors did when they came, to, came out in favor of a southern presidential candidate. We we often forget the other issue with regards to rotation and zoning mm -hmm. is religion. So it's important. I don't want to say perish the thought, but at the same time, even with the Owa massacre, the massacre of Christians, mm -hmm. that is still on the minds in our national consciousness. To propose a Muslim Muslim ticket right now might simply not fly. However, this day has really helpfully to the APC, they should take a look at that, Nigerians in general should as well, come up with a short list of really strong, credible, possible mm -hmm. VP um, contenders for um, the second half of Ashiwa Jubala Metinubu's mm. ticket, including Governor Babagala Zulum, who mm. has been winning rave reviews for how he's managed to turn the fortunes around in Borno State, including um, Governors Bagudu and Badaru. Governors mm. Badaru actually stepped down for um, Bola Metinubu mm -hmm. early on. In the, in the recent mm -hmm. um, developments with the mm -hmm. APC, he might be rewarded in that way, including his old close friend, Kashim Imam, mm -hmm. because one of the issues with the vice president is trust. Mm -hmm. A vice president must be loyal. We mm -hmm. have seen in the history of the Fourth Republic of this country between President Obasanjo and Elijah Atiku Abubakar, where the president felt that his vice president was not loyal mm -hmm. and the consequences. So since then, there's been an emphasis on loyalty for the vice president. When you have a very close personal relationship, then that you know, box is ticked. Mm -hmm. However, I have to come back to the religious insensitivity of having a Muslim Muslim ticket right now. It mm. simply might not work, which is where a boss Mustafa could come into play because he's a Christian. He's highly credible. He's performed very well. Mm. And he's known to the Nigerian public because we saw his face all the time during the COVID lockdown. Mm. He was giving those briefings. So he's not just known in the corridors of power. His face is familiar. His name is familiar. There's that. And also the firebrand um, governor of Kaduna State was also mentioned in the This Day analysis. But that too could be risky. Even he had a bit of backlash, didn't he, mm -hmm. with his own Muslim Muslim ticket. He decided to take that risk. Luckily for him, it paid off. Because what usually happens in Kaduna is that if you have a Muslim um, governor, you should have a Christian mm -hmm. governor. So balance the sensitivities of those in Southern Kaduna. He threw that to the wind, but the risk paid off for him. He might think that that risk might pay off nationally, but what if it doesn't? Mm. I mean, Judy, you've made a very fantastic point as regards that. But let me start from the top. So I think it was two days ago, I was talking about Game of Thrones. And I was talking about the House of Lannister. Let's see what will happen. 
So one thing is certain, the House of Lannister definitely, true to type, paid their debts. The APC paid their debts to Bola Metinubu, rewarded him with the presidential tickets, despite everything that happened. And good on them. Probably the speech on Thursday last week in Abeokuta might have tipped the balance. Probably his political strategy, going out there, the huge war chest, spending money on delegates, might have tipped the balance. Anything he has done, he did well. Kudos to him. It's his day of victory. I'll give it to him. Yes. He lapped his opponent. In Formula One, there's something called lapping. When your car is first and you start to lap the last car at the back, so that's what he did. He lapped all his opponents. Very good on him. This is day for victory. Give it to him. He made a spirited speech, rallies based, called himself the lion invariably by saying, Woo-roar. You know, he's fondly called the lion of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's rallied his base. He's itemized some things he wants to do. But going forward, the house of Lannister now needs to face the house of Stark. I was still on Game of Thrones. <laughs> In this. Dragon Dance. I'm so glad I watched it. And in I Winterfell. So <laughs> that is there. He needs to face the House of Stark, probably that he calls the Poverty People's Party, the PDP. The People's Democratic Party, I should say. But what Tinubu called it was the Poverty Party. And he started by throwing some attacks at them yesterday by saying, you know what? You can't do anything. You're termites and everything. It will come down to the wire. Both parties will go head to head with each other. The BDP came out to say that, oh, we are not troubled that Tinubu is on the APC ticket. Hell no. I laughed at that. It's a joke. They are troubled. Of course they are. They are strategizing <laughs> as we speak. I think somebody also came out more galit to say that, oh, he was going to trounce all of them. I said, oh, really? Moving on from that. But the other point you raised, very vital point, is the possibility that there might be a Muslim Muslim ticket. And that will not augur well. Nigeria. In fact, it's an idea that we should be in. Because we know the religious extremities going on in this country. And you need a balancing. And let's take a look at those candidates. Most of the candidates that can deliver the votes in the North are Muslim. Boss Mustafa we talked about. Great guy. Great lawyer. Secretary to the government. You know, former, uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, Played a fundamental role in the NBA in his home state of Adamawa and all of that, an activist in his own right. But he can't echo out the votes in the North. Let's not deceive ourselves. Does he have a base? No. We all know his emergence, even as SGF, was because somebody was sacked about Chalawal. Governor Lalong comes from a minority group in the North. And don't forget that the chairman of the party is already from the North Central Bloc. You cannot have another North Central blocking Governor Lalong. So both Christians there are already out of the game. The people that can really push the needle for you are the Muslims, which is going to be a tough balancing act. Look at someone like Badru. Badru has been close to Ashiwa Jutunubu for so many years. In fact, he ran under the former ACN ticket for governorship. So he's one of those closest to him. But that Muslim Muslim ticket comes to play. Look at uh, the likes of uh, the governor of KB State. The Muslim Muslim ticket comes to play. He knows his politics, he can reach around and all of that. But the Muslim Muslim ticket, look at Nasir El Rufai. Yes, stalwart out of Kaduna, two time governor now, doing quite well for himself. But the Muslim Muslim ticket comes to play. Look at someone like Baba Gana Zulu, the new poster boy, or let me use the word star boy of the North in quotes. I'm not throwing any shit. Don't look, don't look at me that way, please. I beg you. <laughs> the new star boy of the North. <laughs> Muslim, Muslim ticket again. And let's dial back historically. Nigerians, even since the good old days, have always understood the need for religious balance. The only two times I probably think, even in the military era, that we had a Christian, Christian, can I say, leadership, and a Muslim, Muslim leadership, were well, two specific times in Nigerian history. The time of Yakubu Gowon, where you had Wei, Admiral Wei, as deputy, who was a Christian. And the time of Buhari in 83, where you had Idi Agbo. But that was short lived. Look at other times. Uh, the time of uh, Murtala Mohammed, his de facto vice president was Olusegun Basujo. 
Olisha Gwa Basajo, the first vice president was Yaradua. Babangira, the facto vice president was Ukiwe, and at some point, Augusto Saikomu, uh, Abacha, the facto vice president was my townsman, Olaji Podia, uh, was Abdul Salami Abubakar, the facto president was my Kaiwe. So there's always been a balance. So even the military understands that. And the truth has to be said. MQ Abiola is not on this ballot. No, he's he's only somebody with the might of MQ Abiola that could have gotten away with that in 1993 because he was MQ Abiola. But today, we have Boko Haram. We have insurgency. Tundu, only yesterday, to show you how divided things are, in terms of only yesterday, they had to bury a priest that was kidnapped and they couldn't present his body. So they had to do, uh, what is it called? They had to use another thing to represent his body to bury him. We all saw the Methodist prelate issue. You made mention of the killings in all war. At a time like this, you now think a Muslim, Muslim ticket will fly? So they will have to go back and think, uh, but not at a time like, in fact, Khan has already kicked against it. Christian religion of Nigeria, no Muslim, Muslim ticket, or no Christian, Christian ticket. Because at this time, we're at a point in our country where our country has a press base, and we need to have that religious balance. So it is for them to look in words. It won't fly. Muslim, Muslim ticket? <laughs> Neither would a Christian, Christian ticket fly. What do you think of the fact that only um, Felix Nicholas, the youngest APC aspirant, mentioned that when he stepped down in favor of the vice president, Yemi Oshibajo, talking about how power should now go not just to the South, but to a Christian. That didn't seem to be a factor with the APC, mm. the religious aspect. But mm. he made a point there yes. that it shouldn't be so Muslim heavy, that we do need to balance, because this country is made up of both. That's, that's just the truth of the matter. And Felix Nicholas was right. I'm not going to say because he's a pastor and runs a church out of America and Nigeria. But when you look at the sensitivity of the moment, we are polarized across religion. In an ideal sense, it shouldn't be the case. And please don't compare Nigeria and America here. Nigeria is not America. It's not. It's different. We are polarized down right the middle across religion. And we vote across religious lines. Let's not deceive ourselves. Most of the Christian votes that even President Muhammadu Buhari got was because of a vice president of Shibaju. We can't deceive ourselves. But that's why he was on the ticket. That's, that's why, why he was, was on the valuable. ticket. So there must be a balance. And if anybody tries a Muslim Muslim ticket, there's going to be a backlash because you will see people now come out to vote strictly along the religion. See, don't get me wrong. I am not trying to peddle any religious sentiment here. We are just stating the balance for fairness. But even Ashwaju Tinubu mentioned religious intolerance in his speech. And it's rife at this point yes, in time. It's in the front and program. we can't walk away from it. Yeah, we want Nigeria to be like America, where it's solely based on efficiency, performance, and all of that. But as we speak today, we are split down the middle in terms of polarization. Christian North, Muslim South. I mean, Muslim North, Christian South. And we can't remove ourselves from that. And you see, those Christians there, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. So I, ju I just think the stakeholders will see it and look at it that way. And I repeat, only an MK or Abiola could have gotten away with that. The withdrawal of seven aspirants for Bola Tinubu perhaps set the stage for what led to his landslide victory. Here are some reasons they gave for taking that decision. I'm prepared to sacrifice my ambition to be the president of Nigeria that I would love to recommend to all my supporters, all my delegates, starting from the 48 delegates in Ekiti State, to all my supporters across the length and breadth of the country, is that you please accord me the respect to offer the support you are giving me to my elder brother, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. We have been together for quite some time, and that is Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. So I believe. With your support, with all of us coming together to support him, he will take Nigeria to greater heights. And as a man who is known as the governor that turned boys into men, 
I would have said, yes, indeed, I would have done so. But I don't have to do so by being president. I will join the next president. I will join the next president to turn the boys in Nigeria into men. And therefore, I dub my heart and I urge you that as I withdraw now, vote for Asuaju Ahmed Tunibu. And I feel, as barrister Mrs. Suju Kennedy Ohanenye, that I should step aside for that lifesaver and the best candidate who is Asiwaju Bola Tinubu. I urge my delegates, my supporters, my women to please vote right and cast their vote for Asiwaju Ahmed Tumubu. And and as I say, Yoruba, Tori I hereby withdraw for Ashwa Jubola Amen. We are trained to be fair, and we are trained to know that what is destined for you must come to you. What is not destined for you is never yours. For this reason, I want to reconfirm my withdrawal from this race and invite all my supporters and delegates to support our father our leader Bola Ahmed Tunumbu I have made up my I have made up my mind at this point to step down for a great leader a disciple builder a progressive leader an achiever in the person of Bola Abel. All right. And finally, here's how APC presidential flag bearer was announced coupled with the victory dance by his supporters. And by the power conferred on me as the returning officer of this special presidential primary convention, I Senator Abubakar Atikubagudu, do hereby declare Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinibu as the presidential candidate of our party in the post-coming 2023 presidential election. On your mandate we shall stand. On your mandate we shall stand. On your mandate we shall stand. On your mandate, on your mandate, on your mandate we shall stand. On your mandate we shall. All right. So, uh, victory, if you've got things to say yeah, about the vote. That's a nice victory lap there. Yeah. And it's a lot more satisfactory, I imagine, for him that there was no consensus candidate. Even he, if he had emerged as a consensus candidate, I think the sweeter victory is actually being allowed for the delegates to make mm. their choice. And most of them chose him. Mm. I mean, good one for him. But for me, good one for him. It's his, his, he's got his day in the sun. Congratulations to him. Congratulations to his supporters. But what we want to hear now is the plans, manifestos, let's deal with the empiricals, not abuses. If for anything, I pray that this campaign season is dominated by the conversations. Conversations on debts. Conversations on cost of living crisis in Nigeria. Conversations on inflation. Just only today, government debt has increased to 41 trillion. I know. And we're using over 300 billion to service those debts, or 100 to 300 billion services on a monthly basis. What is he going to do about that? What is the candidate of the AP, uh, PDP2 going to do about that? What are other candidates on the 18 political parties going to do about that? Inflation, conversations on insecurity. How will we have a lasting end to banditry, insurgency, and Boko Haram affairs in this country? Those are the conversations I want to hear. And enough of this abuse, eh? Tamite people party, and eh? no, 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 Evil. that's dirty. Yeah. And trust me, we here in the media, we will not amplify those conversations. We will deal with the meat of the matter, which are the issues that face millions of Nigerians. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have Rotus to give us updates on Africa business activities. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Morning Show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rotus Sadiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Tulu. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning to uh, all our viewers. What a day yesterday, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we start off with debt. And Rufai, you already mentioned this. Um, 41 trillion naira is where we are. Total public debt. Actually, I was going to discuss this yesterday, but there was so much going on. So, But as you said, this is something that... Uh, the uh, presidential candidates need to address front and center. We take a look at the breakdown. Uh, yes, there it is. First quarter, 2022. So total public debt, 41.6 trillion naira. As at December 2021, it was 39.5. So we had an extra 2.4, 2.1 trillion. Part of that was the $1.25 billion euro bond. Part of it was domestic borrowing in the form of treasury bills. Uh, disbursements from multilateral agencies. You look at public debt to GDP ratio, 23.27%. We know we raised our ceiling to 40%. But the, as always, as we've said on this show, uh, debt service to revenue ratio, incredibly high. Look at our revenues. They put, they actually, the, D, the DMO, debt management office, actually put that down there. We bought 5.5 trillion naira between January and November of 2021. We'll get a full scale view of what that is. Could be, you know, I don't know, maybe it's top out at six. Uh, it was 3.96 trillion in 2020. I mean, if that's all you're bringing in, how on earth are you going to service all the things that you need to get done? You're just going to keep borrowing over and over again. So that is something that needs to be addressed by uh, aspirants. So speaking of aspirants, remember when Atiku was re uh, emerged as the candidate of PDP? We went through his... Um, we went through his economic uh, manifesto, which he posted on Instagram. Well, now it's Asiwaju's turn. Let's take a look at what he said. About a week or two ago, he released uh, his, uh, he did there. Yeah, his agenda. So here's what his plans. 12% um, GDP growth over four years. <laughs> on why are you laughing? On average, that is, he's shooting for the stars uh, there. On power, he's saying 15,000 megawatts. He's also promising 24-7 power supply. Removal of fuel subsidies, deregulation of the downstream sector, a new national infrastructure plan. The same thing Atiku did. Atiku also, you know, he wanted to put an infrastructure unit in the presidency and so on and so forth. So infrastructure is really weighing heavily for these folks. Um, six new regional economic development agencies. Uh, Bayo uh, Onanuga, uh, the director of media and communications, is the one that released this. Well, there's another. Let's move to the next set because this is pretty long. 25% budget allocation to education. Uh, as of right now, I think it's just about 10% or under 10% is the budget allocation for education. He says he's going to end the university lecturer strikes. He's going to put them to an end. 10% um, budget allocation to healthcare, um, new agriculture policy, a new commodity exchange board. He also says he's going to strengthen existing commodity exchange. Well, a new one just came on board in Lagos, Lagos Commodity Exchange, where there's going to be trading of, uh, we had the head of uh, Duca Gold on the Global Business Report to talk about that, where you'll be trading on gold bullion bars. And then uh, he says he's going to decentralize the police force. So he's in support of, um, of state police. So that's what his plans are. Now, we got to, you know, let's look at annual GDP growth for the past um, few years. So you can see Nigeria's average, I mean, if you, this is since 2013, but what, 2%, our best performance in between 2013 and now was 6.2% in 2014. You've seen the two recessions. The Buhari administration has been unfortunately unlucky, 2016, 2020. So that has impacted growth. But we've seen the rebound in 2021. So for uh, Asiwaju to promise 12% growth on average, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, he really has to turn things around. Let's look at that. Another thing, check, check this out. Nigerian president's GDP performance since 1999, on average. Olusegun Obasanjo, 1999, 2007, he averaged about 6.95% GDP growth. Uh, Yara Dua, who unfortunately, he had very a short time in office, he tragically passed away. He had 7.98% GDP growth. Good luck, Jonathan. If you average out his term in office, uh, he had 4.8% growth. Unfortunately, the Buhari administration, I know we still got a full year to go, so there's a bit of an asterisk of Buhari. We'll have to you know, take in 2022 uh, when his uh, tenure is over. But on, again, with President Buhari, he had two recessions, so unfortunately, GDP growth is uh, his average is 0.81 percent? It's, pre it's pretty tough. So if you look at the, I mean, the aspirants, I think are these the top four. I don't know if these are the top four. Um, the okay, yeah. So there, these these four gentlemen here. If you take a look at, you know, I guess I'm not sure if it's, you know, if we can. These are the, I mean, the top top four. Mm -hmm. You know, 
they are essentially faced with the economy and how to move things forward. So I don't know what you, Sundu, mm. what do you think? You think we do 12%? I think it's one of those situations where if you shoot for the moon, you land on the stars. Your because, moon. or you shoot for the stars, you land yeah, on the moon. moon. Because 12% is a tall order. But I'm also of the view that electoral campaign promises must be kept. Mm. I don't, I, you know, I hate that Mario mm -hmm. Cuomo's the quote Got saying that you can be. I hate that quote. <laughs> because what you are admitting to is lying to right. the electorate. Right. Embellishing is another word for lying. I'm sorry. So yeah. I think if you. Promise 12%, then you must deliver 12%. What excites me about his, um, um, Ashiwaju Tinubu's plans and also his track record from when he was governor of Lagos State is that whole decentralization of the police. Right. I see him decentralizing everything. Mm. And I've made calls on this show more times than I can remember to bend the 1999 constitution. Right. And he is a fan of a decentralized system, a proper federation. Because you'll recall mm. the spats that he had with the president at the time, with Lucia Guambasanjo, right. when he created more local governments in his own state, which he ought to have been able to do. Right. The constitution mm. should allow that. I really have a huge problem with the unitary system that we, we have. So that whole decentralized of the state police for me is exciting. It okay. does, for me, suggest good things to come where restructuring is concerned. What well, to do? Can the states? Pay the police. That's so. This is the thing they'll yeah, have to. They'll have to know, pull their finger out right. and generate revenue, revenue. like Lagos right, State does. Right, right, right. So this is the thing. It can be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to take on. Can you put up the slide? I'd like to take on every single. Oh, okay, let's put it up. Yeah, yeah, so put it. Uh, there we go. Twelve percent growth impossible. <laughs> okay, you said it. Because uh, I just, so let's, let's, so let's be frank. I, I like to deal with All right, data. fine. Go ahead. What are the IMF projections for growth? For the globe? For the globe? Like 4%, if that. 4%. OECD has got World Bank. They've all, all cut them down. Sub-Saharan Africa, 3.5, 3. 3.4. 3.4, yeah, yeah. 3.4%. Yeah. So even if it comes in 2023, you can't eclipse those projections right. by the IMF. Right. And it's almost impossible. And I'll tell you why. Because for you to grow 10%, you have to be producing at an extreme capacity. Even China, six. China is not growing 10% any yeah, longer. They're five, growing 6%. Six. Right. And even China, when they were growing then, you saw how much they were putting out for them to be able to grow 10%. Have you seen China's export numbers That's, today? The export numbers are crazy. So 300 we'll, million, just so for me. Does Nigeria have the structure? Yeah. Because for you to be able to grow 12%, that means Every region is a production hub. Right. Yeah. You're churning out products, you're churning firing out this, you're, you're firing on all cylinders. In fact, in fact, you are overfiring right. because there should be a knock on effect of inflation mm. because you are overfiring. Yeah. So it's impossible. Let's not deceive ourselves. The second part of it, the uh, second part of that slide. Power. Power, 15,000. It's not possible, again. 15,000 megawatts. Yeah, that's what he's saying. That's what uh, he's saying. It's almost for. impossible because where are you going to get the funds to be able to build up the power plants? We've not been able to seal a deal with Siemens to be able to fix our, what's it called, power infrastructure yeah, and grid. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to go to a regional grid system? What are you definitely going to do? There's a case in point. Bangladesh, it took them years to be able to ramp up. Right. So if you've been at close to four to 5,000 megawatts all this while, it could take you years to be able to ramp up to 15,000 megawatts. Mm. So, so 15,000 megawatts from day one is almost impossible. Look at the Egypt we keep... from day one. No, okay. the first, well, first, yeah, first four, four years. years. Right, so you, even yeah, with yeah. that four-year threshold, it would be a tall order. Mm. Yeah, it could make it, yeah. but based on the empiricals on ground now. You know, and let me even challenge that for that, because if you want to rejig the grid... I think the Siemens decentralized deal, the, okay. to, to rejig the grid, yeah. to decentralize the grid, the Siemens deal was supposed to take five, six years before implementation. There were like three, uh, uh, there was the first phases. So, were phases. so it takes another next six years. Uh, the next part, agri-commodity board, yes, I give No, it, removal of fuel subsidies. Removal of fuel subsidies. Decentralization of the, deregulation of the downstream sector. Is it, is it ready to buy the bullet because the people will cry? Inflation will come at him. So if he takes that decision, it's going to be bold and good on him and we'll support him for that. Mm. New national infrastructure plan, what is he saying? What right. is the infrastructure plan? We've got the first industrial plan, second industrial plan. What is he saying? Regional economic development agencies, I just think they are drain pipes. We all saw what happened with the NDDC at the likes. You want right. to have more development agencies where we can account for the ones on ground. Eradication of university strikes. That might be a tall order. The question is, what plan does he have? Rafai, do you think he can do anything on this list? Can he, can <laughs> Rafai, you know, no, you're no. shooting down everything. No, no, no. no. And, and, and it's incumbent. Oh, okay. All these things I've said, it's incumbent on the Tinobu campaign group to bring a strong rebuttal and argue this point out. And let's argue the point out. I have argued my own part. Okay, is there anything on the list you think he can do? 
No, I gave him. I said the regional board. Okay, the regional board. He'll be able to get that. Uh, 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 the right, power, right. he can get that. 10% okay. allocation to healthcare, he can do that. Okay. 25% budget to education, he can do that. Okay, fine. That, fine. Those are within his reach. All right. All right. What about decentralizing the police force? Decentralizing the police force. How is he going to pay for it? Okay, yeah. Well, it, won't, it won't be the president. Oh, you, so how is the state oh, going you, to pay for it? Oh, you have better faith. <laughs> no, no, no. So it's a comment on them too. And if you bring Atiku Abaka's, uh, what's it called? This is how we'll shred it. Of course. And, and let's argue it. about it. Quanqua. So, and everybody's okay. Everybody, about everybody. It. everybody come to the Arab morning show. Don't need anybody over promising. You. Over right. promising is a form of electoral fraud, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell lies to get into office. Yeah, right. So, this is how we're going. But he can do the 25% allocation. Right. But to education, he can do 10% healthcare. <laughs> But the question is, will that be a long time solution to the end of teacher strike? That's mm. another one. All right. But good luck to thank you. Good you on you, Mrs. Day. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.